Okay, well, speaker of the day. We have the lovely Lee Chantel, also known as Viva La Vegan. Um, Lee Chantel is a published author, an international speaker and consultant, a singer and a songwriter and a blogger. She's based in Brisbane. Uh, Viva La Vegan celebrates its 10th anniversary this year. Wow. Um, which has grown to be a much-loved Australian site educating others about the vegan lifestyle. Lee Chantel's focus has always been on educating people about ethical lifestyle choices, proving that through compassion we can heal ourselves. To do a little bit more of that for us today, we have Lee Chantel. Thank you. I'd really like some more people up front, please. There's quite a lot of space here, so come and sit down. I'm really friendly. So, my name's Lee Chantel. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for staying for the last speaker. Very good. Bonus points. So today my topic is diet, ethics and veganism. And I'm excited about talking about this. Um, I've spoken at a lot of vegan events and animal rights events. And I find a lot of people just focus on food. So I'm going to focus about a lot more than just food because that's what vegan is. I thought I'd just give you a bit of a background about me first. So I've been a vegan for 19 years in January. And um, about 19 years, if you said to someone, I'm a vegan, they'd go, they'd go, yeah, I know what you're talking about. You're my kin, we're gonna be best mates now. Wherever you were in the world, you could say that and you knew exactly what that meant. And now I find that it doesn't necessarily mean that you're for the animals. So if someone says, oh, hey, I'm vegan, and I'm like, hmm, what does that exactly mean to you? Because for a lot of people, it means high carb, low fat, or oil free, paleo vegan, raw carb. There's so many different things that a lot of people use to explain veganism at the moment. Now, I believe that the movement is losing its core ethics. And this, in part, comes from the mainstream media. And the mainstream media, media is watering down veganism with its focus on dietary and weight loss aspects of the movement. So today, I'm going to talk about some things that are beyond food. I'm going to use different words like ethics, like intersectionality, like oppression, privilege, and compassion, and effective communication. So the start of my vegan journey began 19 years ago, and my journey started as a vegetarian, which I'm sure for a lot of people that happens the same way. When I was in year 10 at school, every Saturday night we used to have a leg of lamb. And I knew it was a lamb because that was what it was called. And one day I asked my mum what a particular piece of the leg's lamb was that my sister and I both liked. And she said, it's the Achilles tendon. Now I looked down at my leg because I've also got an Achilles tendon. And I looked at the leg of lamb that we were about to eat. And I made that conscious connection between life and death, the life that once lived that I was about to consume. And from then on, I stopped eating red meat. Later that year, we went on a camp for my school, for a one month camp where the city, city kids went to the country to look after animals. And there I looked after chickens. So after I was looking after chickens, getting to know them, then I did not eat any chicken flesh after that. I became vegetarian because I didn't want anyone to die. I didn't want to hurt anyone, especially just for me to consume. I thought vegetarian was enough because you're not killing anyone, are you? But I soon found out about the dairy industry and about the egg industries. So, in case you're not aware, the dairy industry is very horrific. So is the egg industry. 
With the dairy industry, so many people aren't aware of this, but as mammals, we need to be having, to produce milk, you need to be pregnant. So for cows to produce milk, they need to be pregnant. They're not going to wish to be pregnant as much as dairy companies want them to be. They have to be artificially inseminated or forced to become pregnant, just so people can consume their secretions. There's other things as well that go along with this. There's bobby calves, the little, the little boy calves that get killed. The um, cows, when they're used and abused from the dairy industry, also get killed. So there's still a lot of death that surrounds the dairy industry. So I became vegan originally because I didn't want anyone to die. So when I found out about these issues with the dairy industry, I became vegan. The egg industry as well. There's male chicks that automatically get killed when they're born. There's all the other chicks that get de-beaked all the time, which means you cut off a little bit of their beak. And um, there's all these chickens now that are bred to be massive, and their poor little bodies cannot be sustained. Their legs are tiny, and their bodies are massive, and they can't hold up their own weight. That's horrible. And these animals are used and abused just for people to eat their products. That's not good enough. When I found out about these issues with the egg industry, I became vegan. Ten years ago, I finished studying naturopathy, nutrition, Western herbal medicine. And I released my first vegan recipe calendar. A friend from school came up with the title, which was Viva La Vegan. And this was the beginning of my website, vivalavegan.net. And 10 years ago, this sort of website was the first of its kind. I had people asking me for recipes, putting some quotes, like, can you add this, can you add that? We didn't really have that many vegan websites at that time, which I'm sure some of you would find really weird in this day and age where there's a plethora of vegan blogs. Um, over the past 10 years, this website has grown into an online community, had so much feedback from people about what they'd like, what they'd like added, and um, it's become a mass and a wealth of information in so many ways, from articles, recipes, interviews, blogs, podcasts, videos, e-books, and print books, and so much more. I'm actually going to have a bit of a party to, um, for the 10th anniversary of my website next year, for probably about February, so keep an eye out if you'd like to attend that. And I'm also going to launch my new book, and this is a book about vegan athletes. There's 111 vegan athletes here from all over the world, from all disciplines. It's 340 pages. And um, come and have a look if you want to have a look at it. Over the past 20 years, there's been many, many changes with the vegan and the animal rights movement. At the beginning, we really didn't have many vegan options at all. When you go to the supermarket, you'd be lucky to get soy milk. There was one brand of ice cream that no longer exists, and you just did not get chocolate anywhere. So at the beginning, I had to give up chocolate and ice cream. It was really exciting if you went to a health food store and you actually came across dark chocolate or carob chocolate, you know? That was the most exciting thing in your life for that moment. And now there's so many more shops, there's so many more products, so many businesses, so many restaurants. It's so, so much easier to be vegan and it's so easier to stay vegan. Now the last three to five years, I've really noticed much more use of the term vegan in the mainstream media. 
And as most of the information that is shared and talk, talked about is about eating or not eating certain foods, and it's about weight loss and food items, for example, terms like high carb, low fat, raw till four, I think that the term plant-based should be used here. Now, I fully understand that words change their meaning and they evolve over time, but I do feel it's really hard to comprehend sometimes that I have more in common with a meat eater who's very aware and focused on social justice issues than I do with a vegan who is obsessed with losing weight. And in case you don't know, vegans choose not to consume any animal flesh. Now this includes sea creatures like fish. Some people get confused about this. I don't know why. This includes animal secretions, dairy products. And vegans also choose not to consume animal products like eggs. Byproducts, this includes honey, that's from bees, and gelatin, but it's not just a diet. There's other non-dietary areas that include clothing. For example, as a vegan, you would not wear wool, you would not wear silk, and you would not wear leather. As a vegan, you would only buy cosmetics and household goods that are not tested on animals, that don't have particular products in them that would be harmful to animals or come from animals. For example, lanolin or beeswax. And there's also so many other things where you can help and you can do something good and that vegans would or would not participate in. For example, some companies, places, and events that may exploit animals. This includes zoos, circuses, aquariums, rodeos. So veganism is a set of ethical guidelines that myself and many more choose to commit to. It's my way of leading, by example, to promote peace, love, and compassion to the world. There are many reasons to go vegan. I'm sure you know about the health aspects. There's also environmental aspects, land rights, labor rights, human rights, animal rights and ethics, and feminism. There are many reasons to stay vegan as well. Studies show that more people will actually stay vegan if they are vegan for ethical reasons. So this means something that's beyond you, something that you're doing for someone other than yourself, like for animal rights. And people can definitely become more aware of different issues as they go on. And you may change your reasons over time and hopefully you add more reasons to why you're vegan. To me, veganism encompasses everything I believe in in regards to consciousness raising, oppression, non-objectification, and anti-consumerism. I went vegan primarily for animal rights, and I was involved with feminism beforehand, and I'm now interested in a lot of social justice issues, including environmentalism. And I've recently been interstate at a variety of vegan um, festivals and events. Canberra, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth, back home now. And I've been delivering a similar message to all these places. You can have a look at my other talks on my vivalevegan.net YouTube channel. And some of the other talks I have put a lot more emphasis on other things. So there's one that's called Ethics Beyond the Plate, and there's one that's primarily about intersectionality aspects. And um, I enjoy bringing this message to other people because a lot of people don't seem to think about these issues. And I really want everyone to start thinking outside the square and to think about more things than you just already know. 
Now, you might have heard a term that I just used, intersectionality. I'm not sure if you know what that is, but I'm just going to break it down into a really digestible way for you. Intersectional, intersectionality just means that it links all social justice movements to each other. It works out how we can all work together and make changes. Some examples that intersectionality addresses include racism, sexism, speciesism, homophobia, ableism, and classism. If you don't know what any of those things are, I suggest you do a bit more research, have a look online and find out some more about those things. Now, I think being vegan is a really great way of putting compassion into action, living in line with your beliefs, and leading by example to show others how you want the world to be. But to me, veganism is just one step. It's a really awesome step. It's a really important step, but it's just one step. The vegans choose not to partake in the use, abuse and exploitation of non-human animals for any reason. More focus needs to be on things beyond what we do or what we don't eat. Now, I don't agree 100% with any of the vegan or animal rights groups that exist. But there are really great groups doing a lot of things in the best way that they can, in the best way that they think things can be done. And um, you can always use content that these places create. You can always use their information and share it. Some great examples would be undercover investigations, fact sheets, recipes, interviews and videos, rescue stories even. And there's quite a few places today that I'm sure you've seen outside that are doing some great work. So make sure you find out what they do and get involved in the best way that you can. Now, I just want to go over a few things that I'd really like for you to think about. And I'd like, to do, I'd like for you to do your own research on. And I'm not going to go into too much detail about particular things. You can see my talks on YouTube if you want some more details, or even ask a question at the end if you like. And I just would like you to think about how we can learn to do more, do better, and become better examples of compassion in action. Now, here's, here's one thing. So the vegan diet can be healthy. Um, there's four vegan staples. If you focus on them, you will get everything you need from your diet. Whole grains is one. Fruit and vegetables is another. Nuts and seeds is a third. And beans, legumes, pulses is the last one. Now, a question for you. With the amount of not so healthy vegan foods that are now available, do you think veganism should still be promoted as a healthy diet? And do you think veganism should be promoted as a cure-all diet? Another thing. I've seen a lot more people recently in particular becoming vegan as they're able to control their intake of food and be restrictive with their diets. And this is under the guise of eating healthy. Now what can we do to encourage others to be flexible and open to all types of vegan foods and healthy vegan foods? And what more can we do to encourage long-term commitment to the vegan lifestyle? Now, you might have heard about some of the environmental impacts of, of, the, diet, of the mainstream diet, and there's many benefits to, to adhering to a vegan diet. Some examples of the negative effects include, 
and this is related to animal food products. And they include the efficiency of using animals as a food source. So for example, instead of creating chickpeas to feed people to get their protein, we're feeding chickpeas to animals to then eat the animals as protein. There's a massive scale of industry. Tens of billions of animals are killed annually. I go to the States quite a bit, and it's so horrible just to see the factory farms as you're driving past that just go on and on forever when you're driving. It's just such a massive scale, and it's completely overwhelming. There's land clearing and there's degradation of land all the time across many continents. The greenhouse gases that um, are involved include carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide. And these contribute to about 20 to 50 percent, depending on what study you read, of greenhouse gases. And we're not contributing to these things when we're having a vegan diet. But have you thought about where your vegan food actually comes from? What are the growing, producing and packaging processes of your food? What about travel miles? Have you thought about how far your favourite vegan packaged food comes from? Do you know about food scarcity? Do you know about food security? Do you support in-season, non-genetically mo modified, organic and locally grown produce? To the best of your ability at least. If you're not aware of any of these or anything else I'm talking about, please have a look online and do some research. Now humans are animals too. Unskilled and undocumented workers work in abattoirs in really horrible conditions with bad pay. Now as vegans, we're not really supporting this, are we? But what about your vegan clothing? What about your vegan shoes? What about your favourite brands that you use all the time? Do you know the ethics and the conditions involved in the manufacturing processes and how these products are actually produced? And what about the people that are making them? Do they get paid a fair wage? What about feminism? What about human rights? What about reproductive rights? How do all these things link to veganism? Feminists are against the objectification and the commodification of their bodies. They are against being seen as a product. I'm sure a lot of you are aware about how animals are used as products and commodities. Now, do you think if someone is defending one type of female body while using and abusing another, that this is okay. Now, domestic violence is a massive issue in our society. Um, harming of non-human animals when younger is seen as something that can lead to harming of people when unchecked. So should we dismiss certain types of behaviour just because of someone's age, because of their sex, because of their position in society or their class? Most of us have so many privileges that we're never really going to understand, we're never really going to appreciate and we never will unless they're taken away from us. Keep in mind just a few things. Some people can't choose to not eat a particular food. Some people can't afford to buy new vegan shoes or new vegan clothes. Some people can't access transportation to support vegan restaurants. Some people can't afford to attend vegan events like this, for example. 
some people aren't mentally or physically able to attend protests, to attend demos. It's important to be mindful of these things and to exercise compassion to everyone that we deal with. And ju judgment is really easy for ourselves or for other people, especially because we know it all, don't we? And we have all answers. I said in my talk in Sydney, um, which was the intersectionality one, and I want to reiterate it because I think it's really important. Um, we all have choices but some people have much better choices than other people. And our way is not always the best way. So we can learn from many other social justice areas and other movements. Um, an example I like to give is the LGBTQI community. They have so many allies who are not necessarily LGBT but they're allies to the movement because they be believe in what they're aiming for. Now, how can we participate in other social justice movements and support their causes? And how can we encourage other people to support our vegan movement? And here's the catch, whether or not they're vegan. How can we promote veganism in the most inclusive way? Now, at best, vegans are one to two percent of the population. And um, to, to create something that matters and to make people care and to promote and to market something, you need to focus on people's passions, their motivations, what they're interested in. See how you can plant seeds of compassion to these people. And so, for example, if someone's interested in gardening, you could talk about veganic gardening. If someone's interested in working out or bodybuilding, um, show them Billy Simmons, Ed Bauer in the States. If someone really loves their dogs and their cat friends, you know, talk about how pigs are just as loyal. Do you know about some of these other animals that share similar um, interests? If, the, if they're into the environment, you could talk about some other things like, you know, you don't have to get a hybrid car. You don't have to change all your light bulbs. What about changing what you eat? Now, vegans don't only care about non-human animals. Some people act like that at times. But we really need to start to act like we care about other people as well as the animals. We, no, le we need to learn more about each other and the world around us. Now, all systems of oppression need to be changed. I've gone over quite a few of them today. Um, and I know there's a lot of information, and I know it can be quite overwhelming, and I know we only had 24 hours in a day. But I want you to start with the things that resonate with you the most. What are you most passionate about? What are you best at communicating? Start here, but always be open to learning more. And focus on more good less harm. Let that guide you, especially online. Remember that wrongly or rightly, you may be the only vegan someone knows or someone comes into contact with. What you do and how you do it reflects the whole movement. So really, we need to start acting like that. And here's a few more things I want you to think about. What language do you use when you're promoting veganism? Is it positive? Is it negative? Is it encouraging? Is it discouraging? Is it empathetic? Is it judgmental? Are you preaching or are you teaching? What about racist language? What sort of language do you use when you're talking about other countries and other cultures? 
For example, Japan and their dolphins or the whaling, China and their dog meat, the Middle East and live exports. What about trigger you words? Do you use trigger words that may truly upset someone? These words can include things such as slave, rape, concentration camps. We need to all focus on finding out what connects us to each other and not on the things that we disagree with because we're always going to find something we disagree with. We need to lead by example and be consistent. Over the almost 20 years I've been vegan, that's probably the best advice I can give you going forward. Lead by example, be consistent. And be the best version of yourself. Once you learn something, it can't be unlearned. It may be ignored, and you can probably ignore this for quite a long time in some cases. But small steps still get to the same destination. And what works for you now, right in this moment, may be different for you next year, may be different for you in five years' time. And what works for you may not work for others. Remember that we are all made up of the same things, but we're not all the same. Here's a few things. Focus on encouragement instead of judgment. Focus on education and planting seeds instead of converting. Always remember kindness. Always remember compassion. Be the best vegan that you can be and start now. Now, I hope you've learned something with the talk today. And I'd like you to do your own research, investigate some of the things I've said if you're not aware of them or you'd like to find out more information. Please read more and read stuff that's actually scientifically based because there's a lot of false evidence and false information out there, in particular with health. Um, please have a look at my website, vivalevegan.net, and I'm across all social media channels like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Google+, Pinterest, SoundCloud, Instagram, iTunes. And um, keep in touch, and I'm going to open for some questions now. I hope you have good ones. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. I agree with what you said too. I don't think, you know, plant plant based or people that come to the movement for primarily health reasons doesn't mean that they're not going to care about other issues. I just want people to be aware that there are more issues and to do their own research and find out these things. In particular, because more people who are vegan for other reasons and health outside of their own have been proven to stay vegan for longer. So it's great to have all these new vegans and everything, but I really want long-term vegans for as long as they can be vegan. And the more reasons you have to be vegan, then the more reasons you're going to stick with it. And um, yeah, definitely, it's very cultish. And that's sort of like what I was saying before about being inclusive. So how the only way we're going to take this movement forward is by working with other groups and other people. Because if we're only 1% to 2% of the community, we need this to go forward. How do we do that? And that's encouraging people who aren't necessarily vegan or not vegan enough to come and help us. Well, the ethics around wool or the ethics of any animal's products are that we do not need to use them. We can do quite well without any of these things. That's, for me, enough. But there's also some other issues that are involved. A lot of sheep are grown to produce a lot more wool. So, um, yes, they need to be sheared because they've been built to be like that. And um, until someone, a sheep, can come to me and say, here you go, have my, have 
this stuff off my back, you can wear it, I'm not going to be using it. Um, but there's other things, it's very cruel, and anything that's production line sort of um, assembly or things like that, quick, in, sheep, out, in, out. And they're shearing them very fast, lots of cuts, lots of the animals get hurt. There's a thing called mulesing as well, where they cut off um, areas at the back near the buttocks that can get inf infected and there's a lot of problems that come from that as well. Yeah. Could be um, maybe some insulation around the house, I don't know. Um, but I definitely disagree with um, them trying to sell it to someone to make money from it. Like, I would have issues with that. Um, yeah, that's a hard one. I guess it's where your line is, where their line is. Like, are they vegan? Like, I'm not sure. I don't know the exact case. But yeah, it's just working out what your line is and what you're comfortable with, I believe. Does that look good? Yeah. <laughs> and thanks for mentioning tail docking too. I forgot that. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, it brings like two, re two issues into the play there. One is that there's a lot and a lot of chickens and hens that have been reared primarily for our use and abuse. Um, so that's one issue, and you're rescuing the hen from a horrible life. That's really commendable, and we need more people to do that. There's a group actually in Brisbane called homesforhens.net. You could help out there if you'd like some backyard chickens. Um, my issue with that, and a lot of other vegans' issues, would be you're trying to help the chicken, aren't you? That's the whole idea. It's, you're not getting anything back from it. So when you're saying I'm going to have something from the chicken like an egg, well, another issue with that is chickens lose a lot of nutrients when they're producing eggs for people. So a lot of um, rescue places, a lot of farm animal rescue places will actually just break the chicken's egg up when it's produced or boil it up and break it up and feed it back to the chicken so that they're getting those nutrients back. So to me, that's the best thing that can happen from the situation. Yes, the, egg, the hen is creating the eggs and you're trying to help that hen. You're not trying to see them as an object and what you can get from them. You are going to help them, give them some of the nutrients back. And if they're a battery hen, they're going to have really low nutrients. So that will help. That's a different take on restaurants and inclusivity. I haven't thought of that aspect before. But I'd say generally I think here in Australia we're about five years behind the states in a lot of ways, in particular health and dietary aspects and restaurants. A massive thing is we just don't have the population that the states does, for one. There just aren't as many people here. Therefore, like I was saying before, one to two percent of the population in New York is going to be a hell of a lot different to 1 to 2 percent of the population in Brisbane. So you're going to have, like in New York, there's over 200 vegetarian restaurants. I think there's maybe 10 in Brisbane, off the top of my head, could be wrong with that. And um, there's so many more growing each day and I think um, one of the things that helps is the sort of raw food stuff or the more healthier eating. So um, I travel a lot, I went to Cairns recently, um, drove from Brisbane to Cairns and back and a lot of the stops along the way, there's so many more options than there were even five years ago and it's really impressive. And um, it's good to see, you know, um, a Mexican chain that I really like has like black rice and amaranth, for example, which gets me excited. There's, um, you know, so many places you can go to, you can have like, little bliss balls or raw sort of stuff that they can easily make, so people are including it. Um, I think people in Australia, especially along the coastal areas, care a lot more about their health, so you're seeing more healthy eating options available. And I guess the paleo movement's also quite big. So there's a couple of things from the paleo movement that sort of intersect a bit with, this, with veganism, like the balls, like the smoothies, those sort of things. So I think all that helps. And I think we're on the right track. There's a lot more people doing things, but I think I say to a lot of people, 
they'll want to start a vegan business or vegan product or something, if you are focused on marketing or promoting to a vegan audience, you're really not going to have much of an audience. The vegans will know about your product anyway, so focus on the other people as well. That's your target audience, mainstream people. So how can you make something mainstream, has to taste good, present it well, be consistent? Yeah, thank you very much for your time answering this question. Thanks, everyone.